So as you very likely already know, all sponsoring organizations must meet minimum meal pattern requirements for the summer food service program at all operating sites. School food authorities, on the other hand, may do so by utilizing either the summer food service program meal pattern or the more detailed national school lunch school breakfast program meal pattern. Indication of which meal pattern is being utilized at each operating site must be provided in the site's corresponding online facility level application. And this is actually documented on page three of each facility level online application that you will complete an application on behalf of. So with the exception of school food authorities, all sponsors must utilize the SFSP meal pattern. Therefore, the upcoming slides will be specifically detailing the SFSP meal pattern and not the traditional National School Lunch School Breakfast Program meal pattern. We have other trainings available on the CMP website that go over National School Lunch School Breakfast Program meal pattern, which is also the meal pattern that's required under our other summer program, the Seamless Summer Option. Um, however, as I stated today, we're focusing on the SFSP meal pattern which all non-school food authority sponsors must follow, that includes our university, um, based organizations that participate in SFSP, that includes governmental-based organizations, and that includes our private nonprofit groups. And it may include school food authorities if they elect in their online application to utilize the SFSP meal pattern. Meal pattern and sponsor types. As mentioned, all SFSP sponsors must meet the minimum meal pattern requirements as set forth by the USDA at all participating sites. School food authorities, those school systems that participate in the National School Lunch and Breakfast programs during the school year, may meet these minimum meal pattern requirements through offering the SFSP meal pattern or by offering the more detailed NSLP SVP meal pattern. All other types of SFSP sponsors governmental, private nonprofit, university colleges, will do so by meeting the SFSP meal pattern. And as I stated, these sponsors do not have the option of offering the National School Lunch School Breakfast meal pattern like school food authorities do. And since the school food authorities are already in the business of offering the National School Lunch School Breakfast program meal pattern all throughout the academic school year, which is typically around nine months of the year, the next slides will focus specifically on SFSP meal pattern and what that entails. Before we get specifically into the meal pattern, we want to we do want to talk a little bit about summer food service program meal pattern and how offer versus serve ties in. So for our school food authorities that are electing to operate under the SFSP this summer, offer versus serve is an option under that program. However, please be reminded that if you are following the summer food service program meal pattern and you do elect to offer offer versus serve as an option at breakfast, you do have to, the menu planners do have to change the breakfast menu to ensure that a fourth item is added to that menu each day in order to be compliant with breakfast offer versus serve under the SFSP meal pattern. So this is actually a common error that the state agency has found over the years with summer food service program sponsor. And unfortunately it has resulted in loss of reimbursable meal funding in prior years. So again, when you are planning your breakfast menu for SFSP, if you plan to do offer versus serve at breakfast, you're going to have to offer a fourth breakfast offering. And that can be in the form of an additional bread grain provided that is different from the original bread grain plan for that day. It could be in the form of a different fruit vegetable, or it could be a full serving of meat, meat alternate, as long as it credits at a minimum of one serving. For our non-school food authority sponsors, as I've mentioned, governmental-based, private nonprofit, university or colleges, um, they typically 
per federal regulations, do not have the option to utilize on reverse or serve. However, we have had some waivers available in recent years, and we do have a waiver available for even our non-school food authority sponsors that they can opt into if they do in fact wish to use all reverse to serve um, with their meal pattern. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more, but everyone at this point that's a returning sponsor should have access to the 2022 SFSP online application. And when you go into that purple summer feeding tab, above the applications link on the left-hand toolbar side, you should see a waivers link. And that is where the option to opt in or opt out of the offer versus serve waiver exists. And at this time, there are also two other waiver options which were covered in detail in last week's training. And those are waiver options on um, waiving of the first week program monitoring visit at sites, as well as um, to opt in or opt out of meal service timing to have flexibility in terms of how long you're serving meals for. So all sponsors will have to access the waivers link and submit that as part of their annually required online application. So again, you do not have to use any of these waivers, offer versus serve, um, program monitoring, first week visit, or mealtime service flexibility, but you do have to make an election for each to opt in or opt out and then submit your selections after you've made them for all three. So please be reminded that without the offer versus serve option um, for SFAs or for any non-SFA um, that is electing use of offer versus serve, you must still offer, did I say that incorrectly? You must still offer and the children must select all of the required meal components in the minimum required portions. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. Uh, for any sponsor that is not utilizing offer versus serve, and even school food authorities have the option to decline it. Um, you have to make sure that not only are you meeting the meal pattern and offering all of the required components to children, but you also have to make sure that the children are leaving the line with the full reimbursable meal if you would like to not use offer versus serve. There are some exceptions that do exist, such as the case of a child with a diet order, where you may see the doctor indicate that the child has a milk allergy and you must substitute milk with 100% fruit juice. So in that case, the child would not be leaving with the milk component for breakfast, lunch, or supper, which is a required component. But with that diet order, you're okay in proceeding that way. Otherwise, kids have to take all offerings and minimum required portions if you are electing to not use all professional service. So here's an overview of the summer food service program meal pattern requirements for both breakfast and lunch. Um, and again, this slide is just going to be based on basic or base minimum requirements for SFSP breakfast and lunch or supper meal patterns. Um, these component listings and minimum required portions were not taking into account um, if all the versus serve were to be used. And if that was the case, we'd have to tweak breakfast and add something else. Um, however, for just basic requirements for SFSP, um, breakfast does require the offering of three separate components in the form of three items. So for breakfast, you always have to offer milk to children in a minimum portion of one cup. You always have to offer a vegetable slash fruit offering in a minimum of a half of a cup. And you always have to offer a bread grain in a minimum of one full serving. Um, we will touch on all the components in more detail later. But just as a reminder for the summer food service program meal pattern, bread grains do not all have to be whole grain rich. They, they can be enriched items um, and they're perfectly acceptable and reimbursable. If you're a school system and you're in the, you know, you're accustomed to purchasing whole grain rich items, you certainly can offer those with your summer food service program, even if you're following the SFSP meal pattern, but it's not required to have whole grain rich in your SFSB meal pattern for any meal. For lunch or supper, you're gonna be meeting the requirements by offering four separate components and a total of five offerings or five different items. So again, for lunch or supper, you've gotta have that one cup minimum offering of milk. You have to have a minimum serving of one bread grain enriched 
and or whole grain rich. And then you also have to have a meat meat alternate component and a minimum of two ounces creditable meat meat alternate. I skipped over vegetable fruit because that tends to confuse sponsors a little bit. So for the SFSP meal pattern, um, you are required to offer from the vegetable fruit component for lunch or supper. And the minimum required portion is three quarters of a cup. And you have to achieve that by offering two or more different items under the fruit vegetable component. So you could offer, for instance, a half a cup of applesauce and a quarter cup of diced peaches or diced pears for a total of three quarters of a cup that are coming from two different fruits. Um, or you could do a half cup of some type of vegetable and a quarter cup of some type of fruit. Or you could do a half cup of each and just exceed it and do a full cup serving each day. So it could be an offering of two different fruits, two different vegetables, or one fruit and one vegetable to achieve that minimum of three quarters of a cup. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention on that slide, I'm sorry. For the breakfast meal pattern um, for SFSP, there is no maximum established for 100% fruit juice. So in other words, you could plan to offer a half cup of 100% fruit juice every day at breakfast um, to meet your vegetable fruit requirement, and that's perfectly acceptable. However, there is a maximum that's in place for how much fruit or vegetable juice you can offer at lunch. And for National School Lunch School Breakfast, that is a, a weekly maximum. However, for the Summer Food Service Program, it is a daily maximum. So not to say that you can't offer 100% fruit juice or 100% vegetable juice at lunch or supper for SFSP, you can, but each day in your planned menu, no more than 50% of what you're offering as your fruit vegetable can be in the form of juice. So I don't think anybody's really gonna be able to easily find like a quarter cup serving of juice. Most of them come at least as a half cup minimum. So if you wanted to have fruit juice, on your menu every day for lunch, you could do that if it was a half cup serving of 100% fruit juice. But to make sure that you don't exceed that 50%, you would also need to tack on at least another half cup serving of a different type of fruit or a vegetable to have a total of one full cup of fruit vegetable offered per day. Half of that's coming from 100% fruit juice. The other half is coming from an actual fruit or vegetable. And that way you would be compliant. You'd have fruit juice every day but you still will not exceed 50% in the form of juice on any given day. So this slide is gonna show you the base or basic SFSP snack, and that could be an AM or PM snack, meal pattern requirement. Um, and we also call this the supplement sometimes under SFSP, but supplement and snack are basically one and the same. So for snack, um, there are four possible component groups. And in order to plan and serve a snack that is reimbursable, the menu planner must select two of the four components and offer those in the planned, at least the planned minimum portion. Um, one stipulation that you have to keep in mind though is that USDA does not require, um, even though it seems compliant because you're offering it from two different components, they do not require you to offer the snack. They do not allow you to offer the snack um, in the form of two liquids or two beverages. So if you did three quarters of a cup of 100% apple juice, and then you offered an eight ounce serving of milk, that is the minimum required portions for fruit, vegetable, and for milk, but that would not be permitted because USDA says you can't have two liquids. So you have to have a food offering and the minimum required portion. And then you could also have a beverage if you choose to. Um, one other thing to mention too is um, the milk requirement for summer food service program meal pattern um, is very flexible. Any fat content can be allowed, can be served to children, and you can also be flavored or unflavored. And you do not have to give a choice of different meal options to the kids like you would have to do for national school lunch, school breakfast, or for the seamless summer option. So you could go with 1% chocolate milk and that's what you have at every site and that's what you offer with, with every meal and that's perfectly compliant. 
Um, most of our school systems typically offer, they still offer two or more choices because they're just in the business of doing that during the school year. Um, but technically speaking with SFSP meal pattern, any fat content, any flavor is allowed for the milk component and you do not have to give a choice of two or more milk options. Also, one last thing to mention on snack, AKA supplement. Um, even if you opt in under the offer versus serve waiver, offer versus serve cannot be applied to snack. And that's always been the case because um, essentially they would be declining and walking away with just one offering. So it's not allowed with snack. Um, you can elect or opt into the OBS waiver. And if you're doing like a lunch and a PM snack in each of your facility applications on page three, you can say, yes, I'm doing OBS and you can check lunch and then leave snack unchecked. And you can do that for all of your sites. But again, offer versus serve is not permitted with snack and it's only permitted with breakfast or lunch or supper. Okay, the next slide I've basically um, already indicated um, that you, you know, have to have two different components present um, and at least the minimum required portions and you cannot couple two components in the form of liquid. So you could do a juice plus a milk. Um, you also have to do, like I said, you have to offer from two entirely different component groups. So if you were planning like three quarters of a cup of 100% fruit juice and three quarters of a cup of apple slices, even though that's the minimum required portion in the fruit vegetable group, you're offering two servings from one component. So that's not allowed. Um, but you could, for instance, th do three quarters of a cup of apple slices plus one cup of milk or plus one full serving of bread grain, like animal crackers. So just remember, you can't do the two offerings under the same component and you cannot couple two liquids together. Um, that would not be a reimbursable snack. Okay, some general meal pattern requirements or rules. All participating children must be offered all required meal components as per the meal pattern um, you know, specifies. Otherwise, these meals cannot be claimed for reimbursement. Again, we said that there is an exception, that being diet orders. If there's a clear diet order that indicates that the child must not be given a full component, and most likely that's going to be like a milk allergy. If that diet order indicates that you are to substitute with something else like water or 100% fruit juice, that would still be a reimbursable meal so long as you have that diet order on file. And remember, even with offer versus serve, you still have to offer all meal components and the required portion sizes to all children. It's their choice to then come through the line and make a decision as to whether or not they want to decline up to one of the offerings at breakfast and up to two offerings at lunch. Under OVS, the kids could still, could still leave the line with everything that's offered to them or they could choose to just decline one thing at lunch, milk, for example. Um, it's their choice how they wanna you know, piece together their meal, but they cannot decline more than two of the offerings at lunch, and they cannot decline more than one of the offerings at breakfast under OBS. Also, please be reminded that all meal components must be eaten on site, unless you have requested and received permission from the state agency to allow children to take items off site. An example of that might be like a planned field trip for a given site. So that would be an example of where um, the sponsor is gonna contact the state agency, give them advance notice of, notice of which site or sites will be going on field trips. And in that case, we generally, we need to know the site name or sites if there's multiple going. We need to know which meal type is gonna be consumed off site, um, you know, at the field trip location. And we need to know approximately how many children you anticipate feeding. And then of course, um, safety sanitation must still be adhered to. And oftentimes it's a little bit trickier to make sure that you're following all requirements, especially if you're taking things that are not shelf stable, things that are um, time and temperature sensitive off site. So make sure you're following all requirements of the Louisiana Sanitary Code. Um, another reminder is that all children must first be provided with a meal before any adult may receive a meal and that's inclusive of your kitchen staff and the same also applies for second meals for children so if you have leftovers 
um, and it's like a complete meal, you still have multiple complete meals left, you can elect to give children second meals after all of the children have had an opportunity to get a first meal. Um, real quick on field trips, um, as I had mentioned, the sponsor does have to notify the state agency in advance anytime that there's going to be a change in the approved meal schedule at a site. So that is inclusive of field trips. And in the case of a scheduled field trip, where SFSP meals will be consumed by children off site, written notification should be sent in advance of that um, to me, ideally. Um, and I do want you know written documentation of that. So please do email me that information at shanna.leger at la.gov. Um, and even on a field trip, the same minimum meal pattern requirements must be adhered to if you are planning to claim those meals for reimbursement. And as I mentioned, extra caution should always be exercised to ensure that that food is properly stored and maintained. As a sidebar, um, we do actually have a PDF billable form that sponsors can use for field trip notifications. So if you go to our homepage, the CMP website, um, instead of logging in, underneath the login box, you would click on Memos Resources, and then you would click on Summer Food Service Program. Then you would click to access our form section, and then you can scroll down to amongst all the different subheadings, and you're just going to want to find the subheading Forms. And the name of that uh, prototype document is Field Trip Approval Form. So it's a one-page form. It's a PDF. It's fillable. You can complete it, do a file save as, and then you can just email it to me as an attachment. That's fine. Or you can just provide me all the details that I would need to know in writing and an email if you choose to proceed that way instead. Please be reminded that summer food service program meals must be served only at the times approved in the most current online facility level application. Any changes to your approved serving times or any adjustments to your ADP or anticipated number of children to be fed levels must be submitted online via a revision and approved prior to the change at the impacted sites. Additionally, recycling returned milk or any other discarded items from a served tray or from a, a tray of a child that's already received a meal is not allowed under the Louisiana Sanitary Code. And if you are a sponsor that is delivering meals to alternate sites, you have satellite site operations, you should be sure to maintain the satellite account form. Um, so again, that prototype form is saved under SFSP form section, and the same path will be followed. So from the CMP homepage, without logging in, you click on Memos Resources, then Summer Food Service Program, Forms, and then this one is also saved under the general subheading of forms, and it is saved as a satellite account form. We also have this prototype form saved in our SFSP forms book, which can be found under the memo sections of our website, memo section of our website, and that memo is SFS 20-47. So we posted that in program year 20, and again, that's the SFSP forms book, which should be a comprehensive listing of all the prototype forms that we make available for summer food service program. Um, we covered that in a presentation recently. Please be reminded that there is a table of contents because it's, it's a rather thick book. There's a lot of different prototype forms. So there is a table of contents where you can kind of just quickly see at a glance where the form that you're looking at is located. And below that table of contents, there's a key that has different symbols and it defines what those symbols stand for. So it'll tell you if a form is required, if the form is highly recommended, if the form is optional, et cetera. Um, this is actually a screenshot of our prototype satellite account form. Um, and just as a reminder, the areas that are shaded in white are areas that are to be completed by the driver who's actually delivering those meals. And the area shaded in gray are to be completed by the site representative that's receiving those meals from the driver at the time of receipt. Um, as an administrator of the program, it's really important to periodically check these forms. If this is something that your organization is doing, delivering meals to sites, to make sure that not only are these completed daily um, and in full, but you wanna make sure that they're completed properly, and that you have the proper signatures as well. When we go out on review, we do find these forms sometimes incomplete. So 
Um, there's an area at the top where you document the sponsoring organization's name, the location where the food is ultimately coming from, the location it is going to, the date of this transfer of food, and then you're going to check any meal or meal types that are applicable. So, I mean, theoretically, they could be delivering breakfast for that morning and an AM snack for later in the day or for the following day if it's shelf stable, for example. Um, so you want to make sure that everything's completed in full, it's clear, it's legible, and then that both the driver and the site receiver of the meals are signing and um, indicating the time um, that the meals were either left the cooking facility, in the case of the driver, or were received by the site representative. That's very important. Here's an example of a completed satellite account form. Um, this is an old example, it's from 2016. In this case, um, breakfast was being delivered from Southbridge Elementary, the cooking location to Montgomery Elementary. And there were 75 servings that were delivered and it was delivered in, in bulk, these items. So they weren't pre-plated, unitized, individual. There is a separate section for that right beneath it. But in this case, there was a delivery of bulk items. So they documented everything under that section. Um, and then you can look below to see that the driver, who was Trondra Scott in this case, um, left with the food at 6.05 a.m. And then I was the site receiver and I received those meals at 6.30 a.m. And of course, the person receiving the meals needs to be trained on um, A, ensuring that everything that's listed on this form is actually received and accounted for, and also on B, documenting of temperatures. So if these are foods that are time temperature sensitive, um, a temp should be taken of, of a sample item at departure, and then temp should also be taken and recorded upon receipt. If it's shelf stable items, you still need to track the meals being transferred. You still need to have a record of them going from the central location to the site. But if they're shelf stable, uh, there would be no need to temp them. Um, and this is actually, um, we've had a good bit of conversation about this slide in the past. Um, this is a summer food service program federal regulation that states that um, there are some restrictions that apply when meals are being delivered to summer food service program sites. So meals must be delivered no more than one hour prior to the beginning of meal service. Um, if those meals um, you know, do not have proper facilities to keep them at the right temperature. So if you're delivering and the site has very limited equipment, and it's planning on just serving the meals um, just outright from receipt, then you need to make sure that they don't get there any earlier than an hour before that meal service. However, if you do have facilities um, on site that exist that would allow the food to be stored at proper temperatures, um, then you could deliver it further out or you know, more in advance of that one hour time frame. And that regulation can be, I looked it up this morning, it can be found specifically under the summer federal regulations, which are 7 CFR Part 225. This particular regulation can be found at 7 CFR 225.16, C as in CAT, and 2. And that's under the meal requirements uh, section of the federal reg. So 7 CFR 225.16, C2. Um, also in the SFSP federal regs, there's some additional meal service requirements um, that are still applicable. So those federal regulations indicate that no one sponsor should serve more than 200 sites in their current year um, summer food service program. And additionally, no sponsor should serve more than a maximum total average daily participation of 50,000 children. So that would be taking into account all operations at all sites under your sponsoring organization and tallying up how many kids are being fed per day. So if you are a large organization and you are feeding more than 50,000 children per day amongst all of your sites, you would need to immediately notify the state agency and request permission to be able to do that. Um, when COVID first started, I believe in the first summer, um, summer 2020, we did have one or two sponsors that actually did exceed 50,000 children per day. We had never had that before. Um, so we had to go to the South, Southwest region um, to contact USDA. And oddly enough, they had never had a request 
from this region before for one single sponsor to serve more than 50,000 uh, children in a given day, which I thought was strange because Texas is much larger than us. Um, but in that case, we had to request permission from USDA. We had to make sure there were safeguards in place for that sponsor to be serving that many children, that they had really clean and you know, accurate points of service, and that their program was well documented. Um, so if any of those things apply to you, I don't think it'll apply to anyone this summer, but any sponsors planning to serve more than 200 sites, or if they anticipate at any point in their summer operations that they're going to be serving more than 50,000 children in a given day, please contact the state agency immediately. Um, additionally, the state agency may impose stricter maximums on number of facilities and or ADPs as necessary. So we do have the rights to have a sponsor if we feel like they're expanding too quickly and they're kind of losing control or oversight of all of their facilities. And we have done that in the past. So um, we have capped some sponsors and said you may have more than X number of sites um, in subsequent summers until you can demonstrate that you have proper oversight. That might be 15 sites, that might be 10 sites. It just depends on the situation. Um, and for a large ADP request, um, generally for our school food authorities, you know, we typically grant that because they're mostly serving their own population and they, you know, realistically may have 400 kids coming to a site or they may have multiple school sites funneled into one for summer feeding. But generally for our private nonprofits, if we get an ADP request that's greater than 350, which is the maximum that our system will allow you to input um, as a private nonprofit sponsor, um, we generally do come out to the site once it's begun operating to see if we see any numbers that are approaching that before we override the system and let an ADP greater than 350 go through. Okay, now we're going to switch over to the actual components within the meal pattern. How are we on time, Helen? We have an hour and a half? Yes. Okay. All right, first thing we're going to cover is the milk component. And I did already speak a little bit on that, but um, just to reiterate, um, the milk component offered under any and all of the summer food service program meal patterns, it does have to be pasteurized, it does have to be fluid milk, it does have to be vitamin A and B enriched, but it can be whole milk, skim milk, low fat milk, flavored or unflavored. It must be offered with each reimbursable breakfast, lunch, and or supper. And it's optional with snack as long as two full components are offered you know, from other component groups. Uh, milk cannot be counted towards meal requirements when it's used in recipes. So if you're producing something that calls for milk in the recipe, you're not going to be able to credit that ingredient, whatever quantity that is of milk, towards the milk component for that meal. It has to be the actual fluid milk that you're offering them to consume with their meal. Um, and following the SFSP meal pattern, again, choice of milk is not required. So you don't have to give like a 1% white and a fat-free chocolate as options to the kids. You could just do white milk only. Again, most sponsors do still elect to give them choices just because some kids prefer white milk and some prefer flavor, but that's not required. And we do highly recommend that you do not freeze milk to be used in the SFSP. Um, that tends to cause quality issues and then also um, questionable expiration dates as well. Um, the following slide is going to go over, um, it's going to bullet some items that are not actually creditable under the milk component. So you know, just take note of this slide, make sure you have it handy. Um, a lot of these things are dairy items, but they do not credit towards the milk component or SFSD. Okay, we'll now, we'll now talk about the meat, meat alternate component. So lunch and supper meals are the meals that require that the menu planner um, has creditable meat, meat alternate in the menu. And for both of those, lunch and or supper, you do have to offer a minimum of two ounces of meat, meat alternate. For breakfast, that component is not required, though it can be offered, especially if you're doing offer versus serve and you need to add a fourth item to the menu. It could be a one ounce portion of meat, meat alternate, like ham slices, for example, um, or sausage patties if you have a CM label. For lunch and supper, the edible portion must weigh at least two ounces without the bone. So you want to be sure that even though it may 
if you're offering like drumsticks or something or some type of meat that still has the bone in, you want to make sure that without the bone, it would still, that portion would still bread it as a two ounce serving. So just because it weighs 2.2 ounces on a scale does not mean that it necessarily will credit as two full ounces of editable, uh, of edible meat, meat alternate. Lunch meats and frankfurters must be all beef or all meat with no byproducts or extenders in order to credit under this component. And commercially prepared yogurt, cheese, cheese spreads, and cheese foods or creditable meat alternates when used in the correct quantities. Um, and there's a section later where we talk about child nutrition labels, CN labels, and product formulation statements. But just remember that anything that's commercially prepared, um, like a pre-unitized sausage biscuit that you just keep and serve to the kids, for example, um, you do need to have a CN label. And if you don't have a CN label for that product, then you need a product formulation statement from the manufacturer. Anything that you do not find in the food buying guide um, will need backup, CN label or product formulation statement. This slide is gonna go over a variety of different examples of meat, meat alternate um, offerings that could credit towards the meat, meat alternate component for the SFSP meal pattern. I'm not going to cover all of them, but um, you know, meat, fish, poultry, eggs, um, certain cheeses like American cheddar, cottage, mozzarella, Parmesan ricotta, Swiss, um, dry beans and peas, for example, um, and then even um, products that are mixed or made into food items like ground beef patties, tuna salad, et cetera. So these things are generally creditable. Um, you may need further documentation to prove their crediting, but these things generally do credit under meat and alternate. The next slide is going to cover some examples of um, things that you may want to incorporate into your menu, but they do not actually credit towards meat, meat alternate. Um, I think one of the most upsetting things is bacon. <laughs> Most people get very upset when they realize that bacon does not actually credit as a meat, meat alternate. It's really considered a fat. Um, so offering a bacon as the fourth item for breakfast under offer versus serve would not be getting you in the ballpark of meeting those requirements. It would not be creditable. Beef jerky, for example, cream cheese, coconut, etc. they are not creditable under the meat, meat alternate component. Um, and we have a little sidebar about CN labels, but again, we're gonna get into that further late, later in the presentation. Okay, for the fruit vegetable component, um, for lunch and supper, remember that two or more Different vegetables or fruits must be served for lunch and supper. And the combined serving must be a minimum of three quarters of a cup. So cooked dried beans or peas can actually be counted as either a meat meat alternate or as a vegetable. But the same thing applies here like with national school lunch and school breakfast. You cannot allow the, the beans or peas on the menu to credit as both a vegetable and a meat meat alternate. The menu planner has to decide in advance is this going to represent the meat meat alternate for this lunch or supper, or are these um, beans or peas going to represent um, the vegetable requirement? So you have to go either way, not both. Um, the minimum countable portion of a vegetable or fruit item is an eighth of a cup. So, for example, if you're doing like a side salad, um, you could have like an eighth of a cup of shredded um, carrots and an eighth of a cup of diced tomato, which would give you a quarter of a cup there. Um, and then a half cup of lettuce. And that would give you three quarters of a cup in total, all from different vegetables, which is permittable, that's allowed. Um, again, any juice that's being offered under the fruit vegetable component must be 100% full strength. It can't be like a fruit drink or a fruit mix or anything like that. It's gotta be 100% fruit juice or vegetable juice. And as I mentioned before, at lunch and supper, no more than one half of the total requirements per day may be met with full strength juice. Um, so there's an example at the bottom of the slide where the menu planner has decided to do broccoli and an apple as the fruit vegetable component offerings under lunch. So in this case, we'll just say it's a half cup of broccoli and a half cup of apple for a total of one cup. That's actually more than what's required for that um, component group. You need to have at least three quarters of a cup, but you can exceed the minimum requirements in SFSP because there's no weekly maximums with the SFSP meal pattern. And then we have the little bean in the corner of the slide. Um, 
just reminding you that menu planners have to make the decision or the judgment call on whether or not it's going to credit towards meat, meat alternate or vegetable. Please be reminded that um, when you are trying to meet the fruit vegetable component requirement, you cannot serve two forms of the same fruit or the same vegetable in the same meal. So you could, for example, choose to meet that requirement by offering two different fruits. You could offer, like I said, a half cup of apple juice and then a navel orange that credits as a half a cup. So you have a half cup of each, total of one cup, 50% of your fruit vegetables coming from juice, but you're not exceeding 50% for that day. So you're fine. Um, but you could not, for example, offer a navel orange plus orange juice because you would then be offering fruit of the same type twice, and that's not allowed. The same would be um, in the case of apple plus apple sauce. Um, that would not be permitted. But again, you could do an apple plus orange juice. It's just got to be different offerings. And you can meet that under um, offering two or more different things under fruit, two or more different offerings under vegetable, or you could do it between a mixture of the two, like I had on the previous slide, broccoli plus apple. So this just kind of recaps allowable offerings under the fruit vegetable component. Of course, whole fruits and vegetables, cooked vegetables, bulk strong 100% fruit or vegetable juice, cooked or canned fruit, thawed frozen fruit, and dried fruit. And then this is kind of a little sidebar, and it does seem strange, but it has been confirmed by USDA. Um, so if you have like a pre-made parfait um, that's on your line that has yogurt, granola, and fruit um, combined into a single unit, uh, USDA says that you cannot credit the fruit from that parfait towards the fruit vegetable component uh, because they've all been unitized and mixed into one dish. However, if you allow the kids to assemble the parfait themselves and you serve them yogurt separate from granola, separate from fruit, then you could credit that fruit. It's strange, but that is one of the requirements or rules for SFSD meal patterns. Uh, this slide is going to go over a variety of different examples that are not creditable under the fruit vegetable component. So like I was saying, like fruit punch, fruit drinks, not creditable. It needs to be 100% fruit juice or 100% vegetable juice. Uh, sports drinks like Gatorade um, or Powerade, that kind of stuff is not creditable. Um, pickle, relish, fruit jams, jellies, etc. All right, moving on to the grain bread component. This always gets a little bit tricky to explain, so I'm going to try my very best. Um, under the SFSP meal pattern, each grain bread serving must contain a minimum of 14.75 grams of enriched or whole grain meal or flour, bran and or germ. Um, the reason we mention that is because when the ounce equivalency um, became a thing under national school lunch and breakfast where you needed to have like a minimum of one ounce equivalent of bread grain or one ounce or two ounce equivalents of bread grain per day. Um, it kind of split how grains are credited between those two programs. So in a sense, one easy way to think of it is you're gonna have a separate um, bread grain chart with the different groups that you're gonna use for SFSB if you choose to follow the SFSB meal pattern. If your school system and you're doing SFSP and you're still following National School Lunch School Breakfast, you're going to stick to the same way that you credit your bread grains in the school year. However, if you're doing SFSP meal pattern, there is a separate chart and it actually requires a little bit less of each bread grain to be able to credit as one full serving. So there is a difference between the programs. Um, and if you've been around the block for a while, you'll think of this as the old bread grain chart. Because um, that's what we're still using for the SFSP meal pattern. Uh, with the SFSP meal pattern, cooked and enriched or whole grain rice, macaroni, or noodle products may be used to meet the, the grain bread requirement. And we talk in terms of servings under SFSP meal pattern. So one serving, um, which is required for um, for breakfast, for lunch, for supper, one serving is equal to a half cup of these cooked items: rice, macaroni, or noodle. Um, and I already mentioned that for SFSP milk powder, we're using the old bread grains chart. And Helen has provided the link to that old bread grains chart um, on the slide within the box. So I'll link you straight to it and it'll tell you 
Um, you'll look up the food item that you are interested in looking for crediting information for, whether that's in group A, C, D, et cetera. And it'll tell you what the minimum amount or minimum portion is that you have to offer for it to credit as one full serving. So for SFSP meal pattern, as I previously mentioned, you can meet that meal pattern by offering whole grain or whole wheat bread grain offerings, or you could do it just by doing enriched white grains or a combination of the two, um, whatever you prefer. So whole grain or whole wheat items like bagels, bread, ready to eat cereal, crackers, et cetera. Um, and then also enriched items like bagels, um, cereal that's ready to eat, muffins, crackers, tortillas, et cetera. Um, all of that is allowed to be counted under the SFSB meal pattern. Grains at breakfast. So the serving size for cooked cereal like oatmeal must be at least a half cup to equal one full serving of bread grain. And generally speaking, the serving size of dry cereal must be at least three quarters of a cup or one ounce in weight to equal one serving of bread. Coffee cake, sweet rolls, or donuts made with whole grain or enriched flour can be used as a bread component, bread grain component for breakfast or snacks only. So that actually can be creditable under the SFSP meal pattern for breakfast, for AM or PM snack, but not for lunch and not for supper. More on the bread grain component. Um, as I mentioned, minimum serving sizes for grains and breads really specific to the type of grain bread that you're offering. Um, so that's why it's really important to refer to that bread grain chart that we had referenced on slide 26 in the food buying guide to determine whether commercially prepared items are going to meet the minimum portion size that you need for the meals being served. Um, and just kind of as an FYI, for example, like a bagel would not need to weigh as much to be one full serving as would something with more ingredients. Um, other than just grain, like a muffin. So it's gonna have you know, sugar and egg and other things in it. So um, generally speaking, you need at least a 25 gram bagel in weight to provide one full serving of bread grain under SFSP, whereas you would need a muffin that weighs at least 50 grams to be able to also credit that as one serving. So it just depends on the product and what group they fall under. This slide's gonna provide you with some examples of bread grains that are not creditable under the SFSP mill pattern. So um, remember that hominy, potatoes, potato chips, tapioca pudding do not count towards bread grain component for any meal for the SFSP mill pattern. Okay, more on the meal pattern. Um, so for SFSP, you are allowed, if you're following that meal pattern, to serve larger portions than what the minimum meal pattern specifies. So offering portions of food that are larger than the minimum required serving size, again, it's allowable with the SFSP meal pattern um, as there are no maximum limits on any food component. So those that are familiar with the National School Lunch for Breakfast meal pattern, um, you know, the maximum quantities kind of went out the window a while back, but you still must adhere to certain weekly maximums for calories, saturated fat, sodium. We don't have that for the SFSP meal pattern. So um, many planners are allowed to go over the minimum amounts that are established, the minimum limits. Um, so chosen wisely, additional foods can increase the variety of nutrients offered, such as extra vegetables, fruit, or whole grains. And some other things to be sure to take note of, um, if a program chooses to purchase additional food with SFSP funds, that food must be creditable under the meal pattern requirements to be able to use summer funding to purchase it. There is one exception to that rule, and that would be like condiments and spreads. Um, they're not actually creditable towards any of the components, but um, when they're offered with creditable food, they are exempt from that restriction. So, um, so like jam that you would put on toast, or maybe even like a, a cream cheese spread that you're putting on a bagel. Um, that would be allowable to be purchased with summer money um, and to be planned in the menu, but it doesn't actually credit towards any of the components. Uh, things such as datary being purchased, additional snack items to be served to the kids that are not actually a part of the AM or the PM snack, they're not creditable, and any kind of fruit drinks or beverages that are not 100% fruit juice, 
Um, those cannot be purchased with SFSP funds. So we do have some programs that actually keep the kids pretty active. And so they need beverages beyond just what is offered to them at their SFSP meal times, which may be, you know, 100% juice and or milk. Um, so the program can certainly purchase, you know, supplemental drinks, um, bottled water, Gatorade, et cetera. Um, but those things are not allowable costs under SFSP because they're not creditable. There also is an option to feed smaller portion sizes to children that are six years of age or younger under the SFSP, under the summer program. Um, but in order to do so, the sponsor has to request permission in writing from the state agency, and we have to grant that permission. So essentially what you would be doing is you'd be following the CACFP meal pattern requirements at 7 CFR 226.20 for infants and children under six years old, um, which does allow for smaller serving sizes than what we indicated on previous slides for the SFSP meal pattern. Um, however, if approved for use, the sponsor must be able to ensure that each age group is receiving the appropriate minimum serving sizes indicated in the CACF meat, CACFP meal pattern. Um, and additionally, food should always be of a texture and consistency that is appropriate for the age and development of the child being served. So this is something that requires approval prior to implementing. Um, and honestly, Helen may know differently, but um, I've been the summer coordinator for well, it's going on seven or eight years now. Um, and I, I don't recall getting any of these requests um, to date. Not that a sponsor can't request it if they do have a particular segment of kids that are six years of age and younger. Um, but I would imagine having two different menus with two different sets of portions could get tricky to make sure that the right age kids are getting the right portions. Um, so I don't think we've gotten any of those requests. Um, not so far. Not in several years, um, at least, probably about a decade. But if we do, then we will you know, deal with those as they come in one on one. Okay, some other reminders about SFSP meal pattern, sorry, meal service requirements. And this slide is in particular to when you're serving adult meals. So at each sponsor's discretion, meals may be served to person, persons other than eligible children, such as program and non program adults. However, this may only be done after all participating children have been offered a reimbursable meal first. So if you're serving lunch from 11 to 1, it would not be appropriate, and you're an open site, it would not be appropriate at 12.15, which is still kind of halfway midpoint of your serving time, to serve some meals to program adults or non-program adults. Um, there are some exceptions if you are serving non-program adults, like parents that are accompanying kids. In those cases, you could sell a meal to the parent that's accompanying the child so that they can consume it with the child they're with. Um, but honestly, very few, if any, sponsors um, in our state actually do sell meals to non-program adults. And the distinction between program and non-program adults, if you're not familiar, is that program adults or any staff member that's involved at the site in the actual preparation and or serving of the meals um, so that's like your cafeteria staff, your point of service person, um, people that are actually preparing the meals in the back and or people that are serving the meals at the line. Um, those individuals can actually get a meal after the meal service is done for the kids. And those individuals, quote unquote, program adults, they can get a meal free of charge. So that's considered an allowable cost to summer food service program um, for their service, for their work that they're doing. You can give them one free meal for each meal service that they're a part of if they are producing and are serving the meals to kids. Um, but again, that has to be after the children's meal service is done. Um, and those meals actually do get reported in the claim, but they get reported under other meals, meals not claimed. So you still need to keep track of them and you still need to report them in the claim, but of course only meals served that were complete to eligible children, children 18 years of age and younger, um, you're going to get reimbursement for. Non-program adults essentially are just adults not directly related to the meal preparation or service. So that could be like teachers or teacher's aides or administrators at the school, or it could be, like I said, adults accompanying children. Um, so it's your decision as a sponsoring organization 
whether or not your policy is going to be to provide meals to these individuals. You do not have to. But if you do provide meals to non-program adults, um, the cost of that meal cannot come from summer money. So you either have to charge an appropriate amount for that meal and receive the payment at the time of service, or you have to track those meals and make sure that you have some donation or some other funding source that's going to kick in and cover the meals that you gave them for free. Um, so terrible documentation is needed always, but especially if you're in the business of serving both your cafeteria staff and also selling meals to non-program adults. Um, and of course, when you are documenting your meals, you always need to document them on your daily meal count or appropriate substitute form. Um, you always need to document the types separately. So adult meals must be recorded in the appropriate category. You need to separate program adult meals from non-program adult meals. Um, because again, program adult meals, they can have a free meal and that's okay if the cost of that was covered under summer reimbursement. Not the case for non-program adults. These counts must be maintained separately from reimbursable meals as well. And like I said, it's the sponsor's discretion ultimately to determine whether or not they want to serve adult meals. But do note that any money that is collected for the sale of non-program adult meals must go back into the summer food service program nonprofit account for use in the program. So if you're collecting money for selling meals, it needs to go back into SFSP and spent in allowable ways. Um, and it's really important that sponsors just clearly communicate with their site staff whether or not they're going to sell or serve adult meals. And if they do decide to serve adult meals, which types? Are you just going to allow your cafeteria staff to get a meal free of charge after service is done and not provide to any other adults that might be working within the building or accompanying kids? It's your decision, but you need to have um, you know, procedures and written instruction on how to proceed based on what you ultimately decide to do. Your site staff needs to understand the process. Again, when serving adult meals, those meals served to adults are never reimbursable. There are some exceptions where you might have like an 18 year old that's working at your site um, and maybe they're a volunteer, maybe they're doing it for some hours for some community program. Um, so if you have workers that are 18 years of age or younger, um, you technically could claim that meal for reimbursement because they meet the criteria of an eligible child. But typically speaking, program adults, um, adults that are over the age of 18, they can get a meal free of charge, but that meal will not be reimbursable. We suggest that the price that you charge non-program adults would be what your normal cost is to produce the meal. Um, and of course, be sure to include the cost of commodities. And as I've stated several times now, SFSB funds cannot be used to subsidize the cost of non-program adult meals. So you can't just serve those free of charge to moms and grandmas and administrators and then not recoup that money from some other funding source, whether it's a general fund, donations, um, et cetera. SFSP money cannot be used to cover the cost of those meals. A la carte items is really not something that I'm accustomed to seeing with summer food service programs. Some of our school systems may do it, um, but most of our other sponsor types do not. Um, so that's basically just where you are selling additional items, um, additional food items, additional beverages, ice cream, et cetera. Um, so a la carte items can be sold in the summer food service program, but it's tricky. Documentation has to be very clear um, separation of the two um, activities needs to be done. And um, of course, any money that you collect from extra sales um, would need to be recouped back to SFSP. So um, we do make note that program and non-program, which would be all the core components of the food service must be tracked separately, accounting separately for receipt obligation and expenditure of all SFSP funds. And the sponsor must maintain accounting records documenting proper cost allocation between program, which is reimbursable meals and or program adult meals, and non-program components such as all court of its food service operation. And the state agency must ensure that through the review process that all SFSP reimbursements are used solely for conducting nonprofit food service operations. Um, if anyone has any questions on Alice or considering doing it, 
um, contact us and we can talk about it one on one. But generally speaking, for summer food service program, you know, kids are coming to the site for activities. Kids are coming with the expectation of getting a meal free of charge. So there's really not a very high need to sell additional items to kids. And a lot of the kids don't even come with money to the site. So if it's something that you're considering, do contact us and we can talk about it a bit more. Um, one last topic that I'm going to talk about before I turn it over to Helen to talk about um, menu planning and the food buying guide is form to summer. So because summertime is a time of agricultural abundance, USDA does strongly encourage summer sponsoring organizations to purchase locally when possible at all times. And of course, there are plenty of benefits to purchasing locally. Some include increased participation by improving the quality and the appeal of the meals that you're serving. Um, schools can get started for the upcoming school year with efforts to source locally during the summer months, testing out recipes, using local foods, and creating menus that they're testing out with their SFSP before they ever introduce them um, in the school year for NSLP SVP. Regional producers benefit from having a reliable outlet for their products in summer months. And then of course, kids and teens can access fresh nutritious meals and, um, what's that? Learning activities at meal sites. Stay nourished and active while school is out. Um, we do have some links that you can go to on this slide if you're interested in learning a little bit more about form to summer and procuring local foods. Um, these links should still be live and active that are provided on this slide. So now we have only about 30 minutes left. I'm going to turn it over to Helen and then we will take questions at the end of the complete presentation. Thank you. Okay, so first up for discussion um, is how to plan the meal service for the summer food service program. <clears throat> Advanced planning of meals is essential to a successful summer food service program. To offer nutritious, well-accepted meals to children at a reasonable cost to the program, the sponsor will need to ensure that it provides a variety of foods on its menu, incorporates commodities wherever possible, shops competitively, getting the best quality possible at the lowest rate, utilizes foods in its menu that are in season, and use of off-season items generally comes with a big price tag. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, it also can bring you a little bit of a lower quality. So you need to make sure that you emphasize those in-season items. It takes into the account the type of operation it wishes to run um, with quick expedited meals versus meals that are often made from scra scratch if adequate facilities and staffing exist and plans for that accord accordingly. And finally, it incorporates locally procured foods whenever possible. To help eliminate any guesswork, the USDA Food Buying Guide provides a listing of foods and information to help in determining the amount to purchase to credit foods toward a reimbursable meal. Not only does the Food Buying Guide help the sponsor to determine how hundreds of different food items credit towards the SFSP, but it also helps the sponsor determine how much of a given ingredient or food it needs to purchase to provide a given meal. The food buying guide can be accessed online and there is also a food buying guide online calculator that is very user friendly. It can be accessed at the link listed on this slide and it's also available um, as an app for um, on your smartphone or on your tablet and it's called the Food Buying Guide mobile app. For more detailed information on the Food Buying Guide, let's go over this question. What actually is the Food Buying Guide and why is it important to use production and documentation, um, to use in the process of production and documentation of SFSP meals? Um, food production records, although not required, are a best practice in SFSP. This documentation is completed with a primary goal of illustrating on one page that a reimbursable meal was served to children. The food buying guide is the essential reference for food yield and crediting information for all child nutrition programs and meal patterns. The food buying guide assists CMP operators 
sponsors, food manufacturers, and other stakeholders with purchasing the correct amounts of foods for meeting child nutrition meal programs, meal, meal pattern requirements, determining the contribution that each food makes toward meal pattern requirements, and documentation of appropriate serving sizes on production records to illustrate that a reimbursable meal was prepared and served. So question two is what format is available for using the food buying guide? The food buying guide is, avail is available as an interactive web-based tool, a mobile app and downloadable PDF of the food buying guide manual. And this is printable. It is highly recommended that you print the food buying guide to use as a resource and include penciled in notes and sticky flags for commonly used products. Um, for detailed information and web-based training on the USDA food buying guide, please you use the link provided to USDA's information portal. Another common question regarding the use of the food buying guide is how do I choose the right food product from the multiple items listed in the guide? So the food buying guide for child nutrition programs does include over 2,100 foods. So you'll wanna follow the steps described in the next slide to confidently select the right food in the as purchased form and the correct serving size per meal contribution column description. Information displayed in that row should be used to make food purchasing and production decisions. For the first step, find the correct food item by matching the description or specification of the food in the form that it was purchased. For example, was the item purchased fresh, frozen, canned, or dried? And one uh, example that quickly comes to mind is something like rice. So if you're looking at dried um, white rice, um, that is going to be a very different purchase quantity from something like a pre-prepared um, rice product. So you wanna make, uh, make sure that you very much pay attention to those descriptions um, because every description imaginable pretty much is available in um, both the print and online format. Next in step two, find the menu preparation description in the serving size per meal contribution column that closely matches your food item. Choices listed on this slide represent <clears throat> general categories of most of the options available. For example, for fruit and vegetables, you will need to find the item based on whether it is purchased whole, diced, sliced, raw, cooked, canned, and note how the product will be prepared for service, as with juice or light syrup, drained, heated, or unheated, pureed, etc. For vegetables, check to also see if it is a sauce, a puree, or paste, which may greatly affect the yield and crediting of the vegetable. For meats, determine if it is purchased frozen, raw, fully cooked, or roasted. Also determine if it is a canned item like canned tuna or chicken. For eggs, check the item as purchased to see if it is packaged as shellable eggs, fresh or frozen liquid eggs, or hard cooked eggs. Determine if it is pre-cooked, diced, quartered, or whole as those factors will affect the measurement, serving size, and creditable yield. The cheese item should be selected not only by the type, but also whether it is sliced, diced, or shredded. And this will affect the weight. It'll affect the quantity you purchase. It really affects everything about your grocery list. Continuing to step three, the additional information column may help determine the amount to purchase when the form served is different from the food as purchased or AP form described. In this example, fresh carrots without tops will be prepared to make carrot sticks. These fresh carrots will need to be peeled and trimmed so not all of the purchased amount is edible. Therefore, for every pound of carrots as purchased in this example, only 0.7 pounds will be creditable as edible vegetables. In this example, if a recipe for one half cup serving of carrot and celery sticks were planned and a CNP operator is purchasing carrots, 9.8 pounds per 100 children, would be recorded on the production record next to the vegetable section on the production record. This would provide one fourth cup carrot sticks as a red orange vegetable, and one fourth cup celery sticks needed for 100 servings to complete the one half cup recipe will be explained on the next slide. 
The sponsor determined that the fresh celery already chopped into sticks is the best purchase option based on the latest bid for produce. To complete the carrot and celery sticks purchasing and documentation on a production record, the supervisor finds that the appropriate description listed on the slide of celery fresh sticks ready to use one half inch by four inch. The purchase units for 100 servings for this product is 7.2 pounds. For every 100 children, the supervisor will purchase 7.2 pounds of celery to serve one fourth cup celery of every one fourth cup carrots. To serve the car carrot and celery sticks menu item. Note that while the fresh carrots that required preparation prior to service resulted in a loss of yield due to product loss in peeling, a one pound of fresh carrots yields 0.7 pounds per one pound purchase. The additional information on the celery sticks that are ready to use, yield, excuse me, ready to use, yield one pound of creditable vegetable per one pound of purchased product. This is why fewer pounds of celery sticks will be listed on the production record than pounds of carrots, although both products are listed as fresh, one fourth cup serving. As an example of a best product, a best practice in documenting SFSP meals using production records, follow the documentation listed on this page. After using the food buying guide, the sponsor knows both the amount and type of carrots and celery to purchase and knows how to document the item description, the portion size and cups, and knows to document the total quantity prepared under column five in pounds. The sponsor is now confident that the 100 children forecasted to pick up a meal will be offered a one half cup of creditable vegetable serving with, <clears throat> with all of the uh, requirements included. The Institute of Child Nutrition developed a printable, printable poster called Basics at a Glance. This reference should be used as part of meal planning along with production record documentation to ensure correct utensils and small wares are used based on standardized recipe yield and serving sizes desired for meal service. This resource should be used along with the USDA food buying guide <clears throat> to ensure that meals are reimbursable and served correctly. The basics at a glance provides recipe abbreviations, volume equivalents for liquids, equivalent weights, ladles to select based on portions for service, pan capacity, et cetera. As an example, a common error in service and documentation of serving sizes is in determining the correct scoop size to use for a one half cup serving or other volume serving. The production staff is using standardized recipes, but the service staff is often running out of food. The wrong scoop or ladle size could be the problem. To prevent this kind of error, ask SFSP production and service staff to use the scoop number guide on this poster to determine the correct scoop to use for the portion size listed on a recipe. As a note, sponsors can access the online food buying guide and print the entire guide, or you can print select pages or sections. It's always a good idea to have a hard copy on hand of the guide in order um, in order to use for reference purposes. And it is also a good idea to save a copy of this guide to your computer for easy access. The food buying guide does provide sections on meat and alternates, vegetables and fruits, red grains and milk. As stated earlier, the overall objective is to assist the menu planner in determining the total quantity needed to purchase for each food item in order to produce a specific number of portion, portions for each component in the summer food service program menus. After saving or printing the USDA food buying guide, the guide may be used to manually calculate food quantities that are needed to provide a specified number of servings a particular portion size. The printed version is a valuable resource for production notes and references. Examples of <clears throat> how the food buying guide calculations are performed are on the next slide. As a first example of how a sponsor would use the food buying guide for determining the quantity of food items needed, sponsor XYZ wants to offer a Frito pie on its lunch menu 
The sponsor wishes for the Freedom Pie entree to provide a minimum of one grain bread per serving and wishes to produce 250 servings of this entree at its one site that it operates in the SFSP. What is the total quantity of Frida's needed to produce 250 servings of this entree? To determine this, the sponsor will access the online food buying guide and click on the bread grain section. In this section, the sponsor will need to find the item listed that is most familiar, similar, excuse me, to the product to be used, in this case, Fritos. Please note that products are alph alphabetized to improve the ease at which they can be located. The sponsor finds a corn chips listing. There is a row specific to one half cup, excuse me, one half serving and a row specific to providing enough to offer a full serving of bread green. Second row is the one that we are interested in. This table tells us that there are 15 one serving portions in a pound of corn chips, and that it takes about two thirds of a cup of corn chips to credit as a single bread grain serving. Knowing that we wish to produce 250 single service portions, we then divide 250 total servings by the amount of servings per pound, which is 15, to determine that 16.6 pounds of corn chips would be needed. Please note that anytime rounding is required, it is always advised to round upwards to ensure that enough product is purchased to make the minimum number of portions required. There's also a streamlined process that can be used to calculate food quantities that are needed to provide a specified number of servings of a particular portion size using the online food buying guide calculator which is linked on this page. This slide gives you a screenshot of what the Food Buying Guide Calculator website homepage looks like. The corn chips example is reworked using the calculator on the next few slides. The website gives the user multiple ways to perform a search. For instance, to locate the corn chips under the grain bread component, the user would click on the component group in the top row or could select it in the dropdown to the right under the search feature. The search feature can also be used to locate a specific food item quickly. In this example, we will locate corn chips by clicking on the appropriate component group displayed. The first step is to select tools, then food buying guide calculator, and create shopping list for a new entry. <clears throat> Second, the user will name the shopping list and select the date. Then click the component group you wish to search under and enter the item keyword for the specific food item you are searching, which is in this example, corn chips. The third step will be to determine which result is the best match for the portion you wish to serve and click add. In this example, the second light item is the best option. In the fourth step, click the add button to select the exact item you wish to customize. As a fifth step, click add serving size to provide the serving size and number of servings desired. In our previous example, the sponsor wanted to provide 250 children with one serving of bread grain. And this information is indicated in the red, next to the red arrows. After the user enters the serving size and number of total servings desired, the information highlighted in light blue will update on the screen. Take a look at the red box. This shows the answers we were looking for. The information that was calculated here is the same answer that we manually calculated in the previous example using the print version of the food buying guide. And this final screen that displays for the food item in question will be able to determine the total quantity needed to produce our targeted yield exact quantity needed for 250 servings of corn chips in the Food Buying Guide calculator example is 16.67 pounds. The purchase unit column shows us the measurement that the product will be purchased in, which is pounds. More than likely, you will want to round up the 17 pounds in order to purchase a reasonable quantity that is commonly available. However, if the menu planner already had some corn chips on hand, this may be listed under the number of purchase units on hand, circle in, circled in red. This would allow you to reduce the amount you have to purchase and control excess costs. 
If you have no corn chips on hand, sleep, simply leave that number as zero. Remember to save your work as you go through the online calculation process. Once saved, you may access the tools option and select the Food Buying Guide Calculator, My Shopping Lists to edit existing lists. Also, you may send this list by email, text, or convert it to a PDF for printing your grocery list. As a lot of us may have seen over COVID and some type of quarantine, um, we've been doing a lot of home delivery of groceries. This online calculator works much in the same way you, where you can go back to your old list and take a look, okay, what grocery list did I need in order to prepare these certain menus? And um, you'll be able to quickly access that and see the quantities that you needed in order to prepare. Why do sponsors need to use the food buying guide? Well, there are multiple reasons. Some of the most obvious reasons include that use of the food buying guide ensures that sponsors purchase sufficient quantities of food items needed for a particular component yield. As a reminder, there are both component requirements, which are food groups that must be present at each meal, as well as portion requirements, which are minimum serving sizes in the SFSP meal pattern. Use of the food buying guide helps to prevent the purchase of too much product, which results in waste and overproduction, which is never advised. Please be aware that during the required administrative reviews, state agency and USDA staff will check to ensure that the appropriate amount of food was prepared for the number of servings that are needed. SFSP sites should always plan meals with the intent of serving one reimbursable meal to each eligible child. So let's talk about documentation of processed and commercially prepared foods. For those foods that are a combination of foods that are processed and not listed as described in the food buying guide, the only way for a sponsor to receive credit for that product toward the meal pattern is to obtain a child nutrition label or manufacturer's product formulation statement. CN labels and product formulation statements are the way in which food manufacturers prove to sponsors that the foods they produce meet component requirements for foods that make up a reimbursable meal. These documents explain how products contribute to the meal pattern requirements for meals served under USDA's child nutrition programs. Commercially prepared foods are commonly seen on menus because when they are used, labor, labor and staffing needs are reduced, and many of these products are very desirable to the children that are served. Some common examples would include chicken nuggets at lunch and French toast sticks or pancake on a stick at breakfast. To use products such as these, sponsors must, provide, must be provided with information on the nutritional contribution of the commercially prepared food. Moreover, sponsors will need documentation that shows the creditable portion for prepared, commercially prepared food item based on the content of meat, meat alternate, grain bread, or fruit vegetable. The notation of and or is included as many common commercially prepared foods tend to be combination foods, meaning that they contribute toward two or more component groups in a single dish. Consider chicken nuggets, and documentation on this product typically shows the creditable portion of grain bread and a meat meat alternate for a certain number of nuggets offered. When a sponsor utilizes a commercially prepared product, which is one that is not found in the food buying guide, it must be sure to purchase foods that have the child nutrition or CN label or that a signed product formulation, formulation statement is obtained from the manufacturer. It's important to note that without this, without the CN label, without the product formulation statement, commercially prepared food, on, food items cannot be utilized in child nutrition programs and cannot be credited towards meal pattern components in the summer food service program. So what is a child nutrition label? Well, a CN or child nutrition label is a document that provides a warranty from the manufacturer that a food meets certain nutrition levels. It specifies a product's content and the contribution of the individual contents toward meeting the meal pattern requirements in SFSP and other child nutrition programs. 
It is found on a wide variety of foods sold by major wholesalers and distributors. On this slide, you'll see a sample CN label. The CN label will contain language that is very similar to the, how this example reads. For this particular example, one five ounce pizza with ground beef and vegetable protein product provides two ounce equivalent of meat meat alternate, one half cup serving of vegetables and one and a half servings of grain bread. And this goes toward the contribution for the child nutrition meal pattern requirement. <coughs> Things that you will want to pay close attention to on a CN label are as follows. The six digit CN number provided in the upper left, right hand side. True CN labels will always have a six digit code provided. The CN indication provided on all sides of the sample CN label, as this is always part of an official CN label. The crediting information provided in the, in the text portion of the label. The product should always tell you exactly how many creditable servings of bread, grain, and or meat, meat alternate, or fruit, vegetable, are provided in each serving of the product. The product details should be provided at the very start of the text portion. For example, one five ounce pizza with ground beef and vegetable protein product, et cetera. Area in parentheses at the end of the text portion that states use of this logo and statement is authorized by the Food and Nutrition Service USDA 01-15. This is the phrase contained at the end of an official CN label. Please note that the numeric information at the end provides the customer with information on when this label was issued. In the case of this example, the label was issued in January of 2015. When a sponsor purchases a commercially prepared food product without a CN label, a signed product formulation statement on manufacturer's letter, letterhead may be requested to demonstrate how the product contributes to the meal pattern requirements. Ultimately, it is the program operator or sponsor's responsibility to keep records to document that meals served fulfill the meal pattern requirements. Here's an example of what the proto prototype product formulation statement for meat meat alternate looks like. A manufacturer may use their own prototype, which can be allowed as long as all necessary product information is captured. However, please note that when in doubt, it is always best to request for the manufacturer to complete the product formulation statement request on the state's prototype form. USDA has developed <clears throat> a one-page tip sheet for accepting processed product documentation, which is particularly helpful to sponsors who use commercially prepared food products. The link to access this form can be found at the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> As described in USDA's tip sheet, CN labels provide a warranty against audit claims when the product is used according to the manufacturer's direction. School program operators may submit an original CN label, a photocopy, a photograph of the valid CN label, or, um, or the actual label from the box during an administrative review as acceptable documentation. When a valid CN logo and crediting statement is provided, state reviewers must not request a product formulation statement. So basically what we're saying here is if you have a valid CN label, you um, have provided your information that is required for that um, crediting. According to USDA's tip sheet on product formulation statements, product formulation statements must be on sign letterhead that demonstrates how the process product contributes to the meal pattern requirements. Templates for documenting the meat, meat alternates, grains, fruits, and vegetable components are available on the FNS website on the link on this page. PFS may be modified for various products contributing to more than one meal component. For example, a cheese pizza may credit toward the meat meat alternate grains. And in the, um, in the instance of, uh, especially with NSLP, red orange vegetable subgroup, in the instance of SFSP, it would show some crediting for the vegetable subgroup. The crediting information for each meal component may be documented on the same product formulation statement. 
printable ingredients listed in the product formulation statement much, must match a description in the food buying guide for school meal programs, and it is available at the link on this slide. The PFS should identify that the product's contribution to the meal pattern requirement is not greater than the serving size of the product. So example, if a 2.15 ounce beef patty was provided, it may not credit for more than two ounces of meat meat alternate. A PFS should assure that the creditable components are in the finished product. So um, if you would like to take a look at the screenshot, take, um, take this link and um, put it into your browser to find um, that sample. So let's talk a little bit about cycle menus. Cycle menus are sets of menus that are generally set for a two to four week period and then repeated. So um, there are major benefits to using cycle menus and they include the following. Meal purchases can be planned well in advance. It can simplify food preparation, allows for accurate forecasting and can help to lower food costs. Standardized recipes <clears throat> are key to success in serving reimbursable meals. Standardized recipes for those that have been tried, tested, and shown consistently to provide the same yield. They should be used in all child nutrition programs to ensure that program requirements are met. <clears throat> there are numerous standardized recipes available online for child nutrition programs to use. This slide provides helpful links for planning and serving reimbursable meals. The last link will provide you with a direct link to USDA's standardized recipe database. Crediting information is provided at the end of each recipe and recipes are alphabetized to assist the menu planner with new recipes highlighted at the very top prior to the alphabetized listing of recipes. I wanna thank everyone for your time um, and attention today during today's presentation. Please, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in chat. Um, let me take a look right now and see if any additional questions have come through. <clears throat> okay, so we did have one question. This was toward the beginning of the presentation. I thought it was a, a, a really good question that we should go over. Are there requirements for dark green and red orange, red orange vegetables? All the vegetable subgroups are those in place for summer. And do you want to yeah, respond to that one? Um, so those would only be in place if a school food authority is operating under the summer food service program and they elect to continue to follow the national school lunch school breakfast program. Um, so that would be the only time that that would be in effect. And all of our school food authorities um, should have access to a drop down in each of their facility level applications on page three. That lets them drop down and select whether they want to follow the simplistic summer meal pattern or the traditional school food service meal pattern. So only if you would like to go the school food service meal pattern route, would you need to adhere to those types of requirements. Otherwise, if you're doing SFSP meal pattern, then it's what we've discussed in today's presentation. And there are no subgroup vegetable requirements or whole grain rich requirements for that matter. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I do not see any other questions right now. Um, if you do find that you kind of go take a break and you get back to your desk and you think of all of these questions that maybe just didn't hit you all at once, um, please feel free to contact us at nutrition support um, at child nutrition programs at la.gov or call 225-342-9661 and we'll be happy to assist you.